You know, today we're going to continue with our talks, Friend of Sinners. Friend of Sinners. These last few weeks we've been in this whole collection of talk, Friend of Sinners. And uh, last week we kind of took a pause and took a break of that because we had Children's Cup here uh, to be able to sponsor some kids. And if you weren't here last weekend, it was, a, it was just a great weekend where we were talking about missions and we were able to sponsor some kids uh, they had 15 profiles out there, and, uh, and, and Dan texted me this week, and he said, hey man, I just want you to know that eight of those profiles were actually sponsored, and that was the highest actual sponsor weekend that they've had in 2021. And so I just want to say, man, uh, you know, thank you so much. You need to give yourself a round of applause for that. Uh, it was the highest one that they've had this year so far, and so we're going to be able to see lives changed in the Dominican Republic. And, and whenever we do take a trip there this fall, you're going to be able to see those kids that you did sponsor. And so I want to jump into this, um, this talk today, Friend of Sinners. Um, I, I get excited about this topic because this is something near and dear to my heart. It's something that I love. It's something that I really breathe. And I want our church to be known for this. And uh, if you have your Bible, you can turn with me um, to Luke chapter 15. I want to read this verse to you real quick before we jump into it. Luke 15, verse 20. And it says this, it says, But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And today I've titled this message, if you're taking notes, I've titled this message, Lost and found. Lost and found. Well, Father, we thank you for today. I thank you for everything that you're going to do in us and through us. I pray right now that you would begin to do a work like never before. Father, that everything that comes out of my voice would not be Charles, but it would be the Holy Spirit. And so I pray that you would do that what only you can do. Soften our hearts, soften our minds, so that we can be forever changed in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I remember the first time, uh, first time I actually took my sons, if you don't know my sons, Charlie and Jackson. I had taken them to Disney, and this was years ago. Charlie was four, Jackson was two. And uh, we went to Disney World, and, and it was their first time, and it was actually my first time going back to Disney for about 20 years. I mean, I think I was their age when I had gone to Disney, so it had been a long time for me. And so we, we roll up to Disney, and as we get to Disney, man, we're, we're getting into the gates. And, and if you've ever been to Disney, you know it just says Walt Disney World huge across the interstate when you're pulling into the gates. And, 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 and there's something inside of you that begins to just, like, get excited. I'm like, yeah, oh, yes, we're going to Disney. And Charlie and Jackson are four and two, so they don't know what the heck is going on, but they just see me, and they're like, yeah, okay, we're going to Disney. We get up to Disney World and we park the car and we, we walk, you know, like six country miles just to get to the gate. And uh, I don't know why it's a country mile, a mile's mile, but anyway, you know, it's a Louisiana thing, I guess. But we, we walk six country miles to get to the gate. And as we're walking into the gate, you know, it's that sign that says, the happiest place on earth. Happiest place on earth. And so, man, I'm all giddy like a little schoolboy, you know, just excited because I hadn't been to Disney in years. And the boys are excited about Disney because they had never been. And, and I'm just fired up. I'm like, oh, my gosh, guys, this is going to be the best day ever. And I'm walking into the gates and I'm, I'm seeing Goofy. And I'm like, Goofy, <laughs> it's Goofy, guys. You see Goofy? And they're like, yeah, you're Goofy. Hey, it's Donald, Donald, hey, Donald, just screaming at everybody. I mean, we're walking through the crowd, and we're getting through there, and then finally I see Mickey kind of like walk across the street, and, and here I am, and I'm like, Mickey, Mickey, yo, it's Mickey, boys, it's Mickey. They're like, okay, it's Mickey. I'm like, y'all need to get excited. So I'm running up to Mickey and high-fiving Mickey, and everybody's like, whoa, 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 you know, space. I'm like, nah, man, it's Mickey. And we're riding all the rides, and man, I'm just Jones, and I'm amped all the way up, kind of like right now. And I'm riding all the rides, and we're pulling the kids everywhere, and everything is just a fun day. And, and you know, it's like the best day ever, but it's the worst day ever at the same time. 
Because you know if you've ever been to Disney World during the summer months, it is the hottest experience known to man. I'm looking for the misters. Like, miss me, miss me. But then they sell the misters for like $100. You know, it's just like, I ain't buying that. Let me just get in somebody else's mist. I'm like, hey, spritz me. And I'm looking for these misters. It's hot, it's miserable, but it's the best day ever. And it's just like, man, just excitement all through the park on day one. Day two rolls around. I think the, the adrenaline level of me kind of dropped a little bit. You know, my age started kicking in and the boys were excited now. So we kind of switched roles a little bit. They're like, Daddy, let's go. It's Disney. I'm like, it's five in the morning. So we get up on day two and we're rolling through the park. And here we are rolling through the park and I'm dragging them around. And I started to notice something. While I'm at the park, I started noticing these parents, and I was a little unsure about it, didn't know what was going on, but, but I noticed how these parents had leashes on their children. I don't know if you've ever seen that before. It was the first time I've ever experienced I've never seen a child on a leash before, and I'm like, well, how much fun can they honestly have on a leash? But hey, to each his own, me and my boys, we're going to go run and ham, you know? And so we're running around, we're goofing off, and I'm looking at these parents with leashes and all this stuff. Well, about midday, man, it's hot, I'm tired, I'm hungry, and I pulled a little time out. And I said, hey guys, let's get some food, let's get a drink. And so kind of we pull over on the little sidewalk, not pull over, but you know, step over on the sidewalk. And we go up to one of those ordering type deals right there where you can order it at the little kiosk and then kind of hang out on the sidewalk where it's extra hot some more. And I go there and I'm ordering the food. And as I order the food, I, I, I get all my food and I get the drinks and I turn around and I realize very quickly that Charlie's missing. He's gone. And so I'm looking around me and I'm just kind of like, hey, where's Jackson? Where's Charlie? I don't, you know, I don't, he's like got a finger up his nose or something. I don't know what's going on with Jack, but I'm like, buddy, where's your brother? I don't know. And I'm panicking. I, I, I literally, I'm, I've lost my son and I'm thinking, Charlie, where are you at, buddy? And I'm asking everybody, hey, hey, have you seen my son? You know, he's about this tall. He was wearing this. He's like, no, you know, I don't know who he is, where he is. And, and so I'm panic mode. I find one of the Disney workers and I tell them like, hey, man, I've lost my son. I don't know where he is. Can you please help me find my son? And Charlie! Screaming and they're on the radio like, hey, you know, we have a missing child. And can you imagine the job of finding children at Disney? That's miserable. But they got an amazing system, you know what I mean? So they're on the, the walkie-talkie, hey, we, we have a missing child. And so they go through the process and they're asking me, you know, well, what was he wearing? When was the last time you saw him? Where were you standing? I'm like, over here, about this tall, red shirt, Charlie! And as they're doing this, and as they're trying to find my son, I start to see in the corner of my eye, I start to see this crowd begin to build up. And I look over there, and a lot of people are crowding around, and then all of a sudden I see Mickey kind of crossing the street, and there's people there, and they're waiting to take pictures with Mickey. And right by Mickey, I look, and I see my son. I'm like, Charlie! And I run over to Charlie and I pick him up and I'm like, buddy, you can't do that to daddy. Man, that scared me. Like, I, I thought I lost you. I thought somebody took you. I didn't know what was going on. And he said, man, daddy, I'm, I'm so sorry. I love you. And I was like, I love you too, Mickey. I'm going to deal with you later, punk. You know, and, 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 and I remember hugging Charlie and embracing Charlie and finding something was lost. And as soon as I had that moment, I quickly went and found a gift shop to find a leash. I realized very quickly there's a lot of parents in this park who've lost their children. He still wears it today. You may see him walking around with a leash around him. But you know, I tell you that story because there's value when things are lost. When you lose something of value, you're going to do anything and everything you can until you find it. And I love this passage in Luke chapter 15. 
And as we begin to read Luke chapter 15, 1 through 24, Jesus takes really a whole chapter and he begins to help us understand the importance of the lost. He helps us to understand the value of something that's lost. And I want to read this, this, uh, this passage to you, and it's going to be a little, a little bit of reading, but I just want you to follow along with me. If you don't have your Bible, to be up on the screen in Luke Chapter 15, verse 1 through 24. It says this. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all together around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. I love this part. This is my favorite, one of my favorite parts of this passage because you have two different groups of people. You have religious people. The, 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 the Pharisees, you have the religious people, but then you have the sinners, as they say. You have the tax collectors, the prostitutes. You, you have these two groups of people, and it's literally divided on each side. You have the righteous, so to speak, and you have the riffraff, so to speak. And these righteous people, the religious people, they're gathering around to hear Jesus, and, and they say this, it says, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they muttered. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told him this parable. Isn't it amazing that any time we come to Jesus with a question or a comment or a concern, he throws out a story to you? Like, hey, bro, how about just a direct answer? I'm good with that one, you know? I don't want to read between the lines. Just tell me. Then Jesus told them this parable. He says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he is found? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. He goes on and he tells about the parable of the lost coin. And he says this, he says, Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have lost my coin." In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. He goes on and he tells another parable, the parable of the lost son. And he says, Jesus continued and he says, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to the citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs, and he longed to fill his stomach with the pods of the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. This this is a very, very valuable principle right here. That this son who was out and he took his father's inheritance and he went out and he squandered it. And he he basically, he went out to Vegas and had all the VIP parties you could think of. He had the stretch limousine. He had all the babes with him. He, He did whatever he wanted to do. And he found himself in a situation to where he ran out of money, he ran out of resources. And so here's this Jewish son who is literally working for a guy feeding pigs. And if you know anything about the Jewish faith, you know they weren't allowed to eat pork. And so I think it's ironic that this boy is feeding something that can't even feed himself. I think sin does that to us. It takes us further than we ever want to go. It costs us more than we ever want to pay. It keeps us longer than we ever want to stay. And it promises you fulfillment, but only ends up empty. So this son, he's out there and he's saying to himself, Man, my father's servants have it better than I do. 
when he came to his senses. Man, I, I'm starving to death. I will set out land. I will go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up, went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. So he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they begin to celebrate. You know, as we read through those things, and as we go through each one of those parables, and Jesus talks about the parable of the lost sheep. He's talking about how we can have a group of 99, but if one escapes, he will leave the 99 and run after the one. I think, it, I think of it like this, and, and I, I try to kind of put myself into the, the passage and into the Scripture, and I would almost look at it like this, that is, as if Jesus were in this room today, if he walked into this room today and he, and he saw everybody sitting right here, but he knew that one person was missing, he, he would probably stop the service and he would, he would stop everything and he'd say, hey, hey guys, listen, you that are in this room, that you're, you're okay. Yeah, there's, there's some things that need to be worked on. There's some issues at hand. Everybody's not perfect. But what you are is you are in a group setting. You are in a community of believers who can hold you accountable and keep you safe. But see all of these empty chairs right here? These are, these are empty chairs for those that aren't yet here. And so I must leave the 99. I must leave this room to go out into Marion County, to go out into Ocala so that I can search for those that are lost. So I can search for the one that got away. And I think it's so important that we understand that there's always going to be moments where people begin to drift. There's always moments where people begin to try to leave the flock, leave the community, leave the connection, leave the safety. Because they, get, they say, hey man, I can do it better. I know I'm going through this thing alone, but I can go and I'm going to isolate myself only to find yourself alone and in trouble. Jesus says, hey, no, I, I, I'm going to leave the mass. I'm going to leave this right here so that I can go and run after the one who got away. And he goes on and he talks about the lost coin. Does anybody have a dollar, a $10 bill, a $20 bill real quick? Just want to borrow it. Anybody got one? Anybody got one? $10, $20 bill. Oh, oh, we got one coming up. Let's go. That'll work. That'll work. I had this thought. I want to share it with you. Yeah, here, let's, let's go. Come on, give it up. We got, we got money. Let's go. We got money. We got, we got a dollar bill, y'all. Come on. Got a dollar bill. Jesus begins to talk about the lost coin. And, and, and here's this thought. That as Jesus is talking about the lost coin, I don't think he's talking about money. I don't think he's saying, hey, bring me your money, bring me your money. I don't believe he's saying that in this passage. What I believe that Jesus is saying in this passage is that you are valuable. That, that your value is in who he says you are, not what society says you are. Because a lot of times society will stamp you with this message of I'm not good enough or I'm not pretty enough or I don't have what it takes or, or I'm, I'm too messed up or I've screwed up too many times. And society will say, oh, well, you have lost your value. You've lost it. But just like this dollar bill, if, if I were to take this dollar bill, pretend it's a hundred dollar bill, but if I were to take this hundred dollar bill, we'll believe it in faith. You know, I'm a magician today, turning, taking a dollar, turning it into a hundred. But, uh, but if I were to take this dollar bill and I were to crumple it up, imagine it's larger than a dollar bill, but if I were to crumple it up and I were to say, hey, do you still want this hundred dollar bill? What would you say? You would say yes. 
If I were to take this, this $100 bill and I were to pass it along the road to each and every person in this congregation and every single person touched this $100 bill, would you still want this $100 bill? Yes. If I were to take this $100 bill and drop it and I begin to stomp on it and I begin to walk all over it and I begin to pick this $100 bill up, would you still want this $100 bill? Yes. Why? Because this $100 bill, a.k.a. dollar, this, this $100 bill, it still has the value of the dollar bill. It still has the value. Why? Because our government has sealed this dollar bill with the value that it is. But a lot of times what happens in our life and what happens with us is that we go through life and we, we get passed along from person to person. We get beat up, we get spit out, we get stomped on, and we get devalued deep to society. And so what we feel like is that I have lost my value, I have lost my self-worth. But I'm here to tell you today that your value, your purpose, your self-worth does not come from this world, it comes from Jesus. That your value is not based off of what you've done. Your value is not based off of what your, your, your mistakes are. Your value is based off of the purpose and the desires and the intimacy that you have with Christ. Your value. And Jesus is talking about this, this coin and how this lady will turn over everything to find this one coin because the lost coin still has value. I'm, I want you to know that the lost person in this church, the lost person in Marion County, the lost person outside in, in your atmosphere, in your, in your influence, man, they still have value. I'm tired of hearing and seeing people and having stories told to me. I was just told a story the other day of, of how this pastor ended up committing suicide because he didn't feel like he had value. His church was crumbling. COVID hit. All of his identity and who he was, man, he wasn't able to find his identity in Christ. He found his identity in what he did. And so because it wasn't what he thought or what it was, he ended up taking his life. Story after story after story after story, how people leave and, and people go and people isolate and, and they try to fix things on their own. And they are self-medicating something and when that doesn't work, they feel like their value is gone. But your value is not in who, you, uh, who the world says you are, the value is in who Jesus says you are. And the last parable that Jesus was talking about, the prodigal son as we know it, the son who had squandered all of his stuff and is out there and trying to live this life of his own, is coming back. And I don't know about you if you've ever felt this way or not, but there's, there's times in my life where I have felt like I have messed up so bad, I was embarrassed to go back to the place that I was serving. I was embarrassed to walk through the doors. I was embarrassed to kind of present myself to the people that I was working for and serving under because of something that I did. And so here's this son who's messed up and, and has squandered all of it. And he's saying, man, even if I can just go back to my father and work for him, man, they have it better than I do. And so he finds himself picking himself up and walking back to his father's house. And I love it because as the father is working, the Bible says that, that as he was doing his day-to-day -day routine, he didn't stop what he was doing. He didn't stop working. He didn't stop serving. He didn't do all of those things. But as he was doing what he was supposed to do, his eyes were always on the horizon. They're always on the horizon. And here comes the son one day walking back, stinky, working in pig pens and, and, and filthy. He's walking back and his father sees him a long ways off. And the Bible says that he hikes up his robe a little bit, which was undignified. And the Bible says that he began to take off running to his son, which was undignified. You weren't supposed to do it back then. And so this father is running to embrace his filthy, stinky son. And here he is, finally back home. 
And the father says, man, break out the best of the best because I want to give my son what he deserves. Listen, if you're in this room today and you feel that way or you feel like, man, you're too ashamed to go, uh, go back to Jesus or come back to the church or whatever it is, I don't know what it is that you may be dealing with today, but I want you to know that there is a Father's love that is waiting to embrace you and love you and welcome you back because it's only His love that can begin to clean you up. You know, when I was, uh, <clears throat> when Charlie was first born, um, I wasn't like the best diaper changer in the world, you know. And so when Charlie was first born, I was still trying to figure this whole thing out and figure out what I was supposed to do. And I kind of like pawned Charlie off to his mom when he had a blowout, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know what to do here, you know, I'm not really sure. And so here's Charlie, and it's that moment where, you know, as a child, as a, as, as a young child, whenever they kind of mess their diapers, they, they tend to kind of hide, you know what I'm talking about? If, if anybody has a child, you know what I'm talking about two-year-old, three-year-old, you know, they mess their diapers and they kind of go hide behind a curtain somewhere. They, 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 they tend to hide. I'm like, hey, man, where you at? Where you at? Where you at? Always losing Charlie. Not really sure what's going on, but I'm always losing Charlie. And so I finally find him and he's kind of tucked away behind the curtain. I'm like, hey, man, you got to go to the bathroom? Mm -mm. <laughs> no. Did you mess yourself? Mm -mm. No. Good. And I can smell it, obviously. He's got mess all over the place. And, you know, so I finally find Charlie, and I pick him up, and I carry him into his room. And as I'm carrying him into his room, I put him down on the little changing table thing. And here I am beginning to kind of pinch my nose, put a little hanky around my face. I mean, this thing was brutal. I mean, peeling paint off the wall. And so here I am trying to change Charlie. His mom wasn't around, and he's just, he's kind of one of those mover babies where they just don't stay still, and, and he's moving and twirling and messing. I'm like, God, just stay still. He's messing everything up. Stuff coming out of the diaper, now it's on me. It's more on him. It's all on his stomach. I'm like, I don't know what to do. And so I finally get to the place to where I, I'm looking at Charlie and, He's just laying there and he's smiling at me and I'm like, ah. <laughs> I'm looking at him. And I'm thinking to myself, Wait, okay, I don't, I don't know, but I'm just going to do the best I can. I wasn't great at this. But here I am and I take about a hundred wipes. And I, and I begin to wipe him really from his chest down. You know, I'm like wiping it all off of him. I'm getting under his armpits. I mean, I had a mess everywhere. It was filthy. And I'm wiping him down, and as I'm wiping him down, and I'm, I'm get all the mess off of him, I throw it in one of those little uh, genie things, and, and I throw it in there, and I grab a clean diaper, and I remember so clearly, I, I remember so clearly God speaking to me. And if you have a child, you understand that like God speaks to you so clearly through your kids. And here I am with Charlie. I've wiped him down. I threw it away. And, and I felt like the Holy Spirit began to say this to me. He says, just like you're changing your son. Just like you're wiping him down. Just like you're cleaning him up. You're not over Charlie saying, oh man, I can't believe this. This is so disgusting. How could you do such a thing? This is the nastiest thing ever. How dare you? I'm not looking at my son saying those things. I'm looking at my son and I'm wiping him and I'm cleaning him off. I'm cleaning him, uh, you, you know, whole again. I'm, I'm wiping all the filth off of him. I took a new diaper and I put a new diaper on him. And just like I'm cleaning and wiping and putting a fresh garment on Charlie, Jesus does the same thing for us. He takes our mess and he cleanses it. He doesn't air it out there for the whole world to see. He doesn't lift you up and say, you see this person? You, you see how filthy they are? Hey, y'all better learn from this. You see how this is? You better learn from all of this. He does not air out your laundry. He takes you and He covers you in grace. He covers you and, and cleanses you and He puts fresh garments over you so that when you step out into public, people will view you as Christ views you, clean and whole. And there's people in our community right now that need to know the love of God. 
There are people in our city. There are people in our family. There are people in our workplaces that need to know the love of Christ. They need to know that He will cover them, that He he, he wraps His arms around them, that He will do anything and everything short of sin to be able to go embrace those that are lost. The value of loss, Jesus tells us in three different parables as he's speaking to religious people. Listen, I don't want us to be a church that people view us and say, oh, well, that's just that's just Revo. They're just kind of, you know, that's just what they do. They're on their own little world over there, their own little island. No, this is not about an island or a building. This is not about just showing up on a Sunday. This is about helping those that are in need. This is about finding and looking for those that are lost. It's about embracing those that are coming out, but looking for those that are lost. It's never been about a Sunday. It's never been about just this. It's always been about how can we help people take their next step. Whatever your your, your situation is, whatever you've gone through, whatever you've walked away from or walked into, whatever that case may be, we're not here to judge you or to label you or to to put your self-worth down. We're here to lift you up and say, listen, it's okay, Let's, let's take the next step. This is the best week ever, guys. The best week ever for us to be able to love our community, to love our city, to love our neighbors, to love our workplaces. You know, as you're sitting down, you see a stack of 10 door hangers sitting on your seat. Why? Because we want to make it easy for you to invite people to church. We want this week to be the best week ever. Because do you remember what it was like when you were lost? You remember what it was like when you maybe came to church for a little while and then you left, whether it's this one or another one? Do you remember what it felt like when you were lonely and empty on the inside? Do you remember what it felt like when you felt like, man, I'm all alone. Does anybody even care? I'm just kind of out here doing my own thing. Do you remember that feeling? That feeling that you felt is the same way that other people feel. And I will, I will stop a Sunday service if it means that we never go and search for the lost. It is about the lost. It is about those that aren't yet here. It's about filling each and every seat. It's about multiplying heaven and depopulating hell. That is our call. That is our job. That is our mission. Go and make disciples. Not to sit and just receive. It's to go and create. And that's my challenge for you this week. My challenge for you this week is not to just sit in idle times. 79% of the people said that they will come to church, not based off of a preaching, not based off of a program, not based off of of, of the fun factor. 79% of the people said that they will come to church by a family or a friend inviting them. Let's just round up. That's 80%. It's almost halfway there. Huh, got you. Just kidding. It's more than halfway there. Inside joke. Eight out of ten people are going to come to church if you invite them. I gave you ten door hangers. Can y'all vision something with me real quick? Vision something with me real quick. I want you to envision this room next Sunday overflowing with people's lives being transformed. I want you to envision with me for a second next Sunday people's marriages that are coming in on the brinks of divorce but God and the Holy Spirit gets a hold of them and something happens on the inside and they reunite with this affection and love for one another. I want you to vision with me for a second those that are coming in with an addictive personality or they're walking through addiction and and God just delivers them. I want you to imagine with me for a second those that are coming in for the very last time And saying, God, if you don't show up right now, then I'm ending it all. If you don't show up today, then I'm going to take my life. I want you to envision with me the people that are hurting and dying and the lost that are begging to come home. Vision that moment with me. When next weekend when we're preaching a message and the Holy Spirit shows up and I believe that the altars and and people's salvations and the hands are going to be lifted higher than ever. Because they're hungry. They're hungry for the Word of God. They're hungry for truth. They're hungry for affection. They're hungry for a touch from Jesus. 
All it takes is a touch. We have to embrace those that are coming, but we have to look for those that are lost. And I can get the band to come back up here with me. I know this was a little bit different of a message today, guys, but I, I want you to know the importance of this. Revo Church has never just been a church for Sunday. It's never been that. It's never my heart to just show up on Sunday and, oh, let's just have a service. It has always been about the lost. It's always been about making people feel comfortable when they come in here. Whether you're trying to figure out what type of relationship you want to be in, whether you're trying to figure out what gender you are. I mean, listen, I, I don't care about all that stuff. I want people to meet Jesus. Because when they meet and encounter Jesus, that is when transformation happens. Let us be that church. When people walk in those doors, they feel more loved, more welcomed, more appreciated. So that when they leave this church, they'll never be the same again. Why don't you stand with me? Father, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for who you are. I thank you for what you're doing. And I think, Father, today was more of like a declaration a war cry type deal where we're not going to stop. We're not going to quit until every person that we encounter knows God, finds freedom, discovers their purpose and makes a difference. God, that we're not going to stop until we can see people find their value and their worth in you. Father, we're not going to stop until we see marriages restored. We're not going to stop until we see lives transformed. Those that are willing to end it, they find their mercy and their grace and their love in you God we're not going to stop we're going to keep pressing forward we're going to keep moving forward because we see a church that is not just about us but we see a church that's about other people that aren't yet here Father search our hearts search our minds so that we can be the best that we can be in you Come on, with every head bowed, every eyes closed, I want to ask this question. If you're in here today, I just want to pray for you. And you say, you know what, Pastor Charles, man, I just, I feel like, man, I just cannot find my value in Jesus. I've been passed along, I've been stepped on, I've been spit on, I've been, I've just been kind of moved through. And I, I feel like I'm finding my value in what the world is telling me, but I'm not finding my value in Christ. And if you're in here this morning and you just say, man, can you just pray for me? Because I want to be able to have that hope and that joy. I want to be able to have the comfort that Jesus wraps his arms around me. And I know today that when I leave, I am walking into my purpose and walking into my destiny and walking into who I am in Christ. If you need prayer and that's you, I just want you to slip up a hand real quick. I just want to pray for you. One, two, awesome. Three, four. Father, I pray for every single hand that was lifted. Maybe every hand that wasn't lifted. God, I pray right now that we would have a touch from you. Holy Spirit, we, we, we position ourselves in a way that you would begin to touch our hearts. That you would touch our minds. Father, that we position ourselves right now that, that you would guide us and that you would direct us. That you would let them know their value and who they are. That you would let them know that it doesn't matter what has gone on in, it, with them. It doesn't matter what situations have happened. It doesn't matter what mistakes have happened. But their value comes from you. I pray today that you would just inject hope and peace and joy into their lives so that as they leave today that they'd never be the same again they can walk out with their head high and their shoulders back they can walk out knowing who they are in you come on I'll never end a message without this question if you're in here today and you just say you know what I feel like I might be like a prodigal son 
And maybe I had a relationship with Jesus. Maybe I don't have a relationship with Jesus. But you found yourself drifting a little ways away from who Jesus is. You find yourself a little far out. And and today it is a reminder that how much he loves you and you want to come back home. If you're in here today and you just say, hey, can you pray for me? Because, I mean, I want to come back home. I want to come back to a relationship with Jesus. If that's you, just lift up a hand. I want to pray for you. One, two, three. Four, five. Father, I thank you so much for every hand lifted. The Bible, what we just read is that if one person, if one person comes back home, then all of heaven rejoices. Come on, all of heaven right now is rejoicing over the five hands that were lifted. All of heaven is celebrating you right now today. And so I want everybody to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Dear Jesus, I thank you for today, for loving me, finding me, and embracing me. And today, as I receive you and you receive me, come on, I will never be the same again. Say it again. Say never, never, never. Say it. Say never, never, never. Be the same again in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Come on, why don't we give all praise right now? Five people that received or rededicated their life to Christ. Man, what an amazing, amazing day today is. Come on, you can-